All right. Welcome to Main Street Books here in Davidson, North Carolina, reaching across the digital divide to Deep Run, North Carolina. It's really, really good to see all of your faces tonight. Thanks so much for being here. I'm Ada Fitzgerald. I'm the proprietor here at Main Street Books in downtown Davidson, North Carolina. I want to thank you all for your very intentional support for our bookstore and for our guest of honor in this time when having a brick and mortar shop and also publishing a new book are extremely challenging. Um, I know that it um, takes some real time and space to, to bring yourselves to this digital place. And I really appreciate it. So let's spend tonight in celebration. Uh, we're welcoming the arrival of a culinary gem, Chef Vivian Howard to our virtual space. She has by all means earned her title of chef. She runs the restaurants Chef and the Farmer, Benny's Big Time, Lenore and Handy and Hot. She's the Peabody, Emmy and James Beard award-winning co-creator of the PBS television shows Somewhere South and A Chef's Life. And she wrote the New York Times best-selling cookbook Deep Run Roots, which we have very fond memories of celebrating here at Main Street Books in 2016. That said, the cookbook that hits streets today, this will make it taste good, um, is all about her experience as a home cook. And there are essays, of course. It's organized by flavor. Could it be organized any other way? Um, and we're gonna hear and see all about how to romance your recipes with her R-rated onions. Please feel free to submit your comments and questions in our chat. Our events manager, Beth, is here and will moderate a Q&A at the end of um, Vivian's talk and demo. Please keep yourself muted and go ahead and turn off your video. This will open the curtain, so to speak, and put Vivian at center stage. Um, we recommend viewing her in speaker mode on your end, um, and you can access that at the top right of your screen. Gentle readers, it is my honor and pleasure to present Vivian Howard. Hi, um, and thank you to Main Street Books for having me tonight. The book came out today. I think I'm trying to do too many things at one time. <laughs> Hold on, I'm gonna turn this sucker off, okay? because uh, I don't want to burn anything before I, on launch day. I'm thinking that would mean, that would not bode well for uh, the book. So yes, thank you Main Street Books for having me. I was, we were chatting before we went live uh, about my last book tour and how my event at Main Street Books was um, one of the most memorable ones because uh, they, the people in Davidson were so warm and excited and, and generous and someone made me a, um, a, a giant food truck cake that must have taken several days to, to make happen. So I, I will never forget that and um, I'm so happy to be here tonight. So yes, my second cookbook, uh, this will make it taste good came out today and I just took the, um, what do you call it? The jacket, the jacket cover. I just took that off. Um, it's nice. It's a picture of me, but I don't love the ones in my house will look like this. <laughs> just cause you know, too many pictures of Vivian or too many pictures of Vivian, but there's some really good ones in here. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so yes, my first book was, um, was a, a love letter to Eastern North Carolina and our food ways. And the second book is really more about the way that I cook at home. And that has been informed by the way I cook in my restaurants. And, and honestly, I think that the way I cook in my restaurants is like just about every chef, uh, we have these little things that we make. They're recipes, they don't necessarily take a long time. Um, sometimes they take a while to develop. Um, but they're, they're recipes that um, we call on to make our food our food. And we call on them 
during service to make really simple ingredients exciting when combined with these particular things. So I call them like flavor heroes or building blocks. Um, but essentially, they, the, the spirit of them is that they're condiments, but they're condiments that go into food often rather than just going on top. And so when I used to like cook at Chef and the Farmer every single night and rarely cook at home, I had very little use for my flavor heroes at home. But when I started making the show and my life and work took me out of the restaurant more, um, I found that like, I really wanted to have these things at home when I was making dinner for my family. So I would steal them from Chef and the Farmer and bring them home and have them in, you know, just like little jars in my refrigerator. And I found that I could like whip up a, a really delicious, exciting meal in 20 to 30 minutes because I had these flavor heroes on hand. So I, knowing that, um, I set out to write my second cookbook and, and the idea was that it was going to be simple. I woke up for a year every morning um, after a chef's, uh, after uh, Deep Run Roots came out and read the new Amazon reviews on the book. And the thing that I read occasionally, but it was a trend, was that they wanted simple recipes. So I decided I was going to write a simple book, it, even if it killed me. So I started doing that and I was so bored. Like the food was good, but it was just kind of like, um, there was none of me in it. It's not the way that I cook. Uh, so the last chapter in the book was called, this will make it taste good. And it was uh, a chapter full of recipes of all of my flavor heroes. It's like, hey, you know, if you really want to make this dish shine, if you really want to take this next level, make these things and insert it here. And so I got fed up um, because I only want to do what I want to do. And I decided that I would like turn the idea for the book on its head and write a book about that chapter essentially. So there are 10 chapters in this book and I hope all of you watching will have one. Um, and each one is about one of my flavor heroes. Um, and you know, there are things called Little Green Dress, which is essentially like uh, chimichurri and a salsa ver verde, like had a baby in a bed of olives. And it's called Little Green Dress because Little Black Dress um, goes well with anything. So get it. Um, there's uh, a chapter called Can You Kraut, which is all about encouraging you to make kraut at home uh, because it is good for you. It's a great ingredient to incorporate into things because it brings acidity and crunch and funk. Uh, there's a chapter called Community Organizer um, that is kind of like a Southern Sofrito that is amazing, like blended with beans or meat is kind of like hamburger helper, but not, okay? Um, and the chapter that we're talking about tonight is called R-Rated Onions. And so R-Rated Onions in, in many ways was one of the first like jumping off places for this book because uh, R-Rated Onions is about caramelized onions, okay? And I think that caramelized onions are something that we get so wrong, both in cookbooks and in our home kitchens, because, you know, I'm guilty of this. I, in a lot of recipes and deep run roots, I said, caramelize the onions for 10 minutes. Well, that's not caramelized onions. So I wanted to write an ode to true and deep caramelized onions. And you'll see that all the chapters in this book have these like, you know, kind of like whimsical names that really speak to what that ingredient will do in your food. So this is called R-rated onions because the onions as they cook, they get like sexy and rich and sweet and meaty. And so there you go, R-rated onions. So every chapter opens like this with a, a really like um, in-depth, look at what that ingredient looks like or that flavor hero and then a process shot of how to make it happen and then a portrait this is one of this has been one of the funnest parts of the book although it's like kind of i feel weird talking about it um but every every chapter i like impersonate the flavor hero 
Um, so this one is R-rated onions. And so I'm here like looking my like most sultry, most sexy, like kind of getting ready to make love to an onion. So just know that this is all in fun, okay? I do not, you know, fancy raw onions that enticing. Um, but it's another brand of storytelling for the book. So tonight we're gonna properly learn to make caramelized onions. And then we're gonna make one of my favorite recipes in the caramelized onion chapter, because after you, know, you read about why I make caramelized onions, what they are and what they mean in our kitchens, uh, you'll see that there's a bunch of no brainer ways to use them. Really easy things like add to scrambled eggs or quiche or frittatas, uh, how to store them properly for long shelf life, um, how to put them on like baked potatoes and serve with like Parmesan and olive oil, all like really easy, like not even worth a recipe, but just like, hey, this is a no brainer thing to do. And then there's an entire chapter of recipes following all of that on how to use R-rated onions. And here we have like sloppy joe, shired egg. Shired eggs are just like a way to bake eggs um, in a liquid of sorts. Uh, I've got a uh, people pleaser party dip because I'm a people pleaser. Tomato pie for dough dummies in this chapter. Cheaters only barbecue. Um, all of these recipes are meant to be really simple. So if you make the flavor hero, everything else happens really, really fast. And tonight, after we start our caramelized onions, we're gonna make something called pinch me Frenchy. Uh, because when we think about caramelized onions, I think we often think about French onion soup. Uh, but you know, I felt like you could find a million recipes for French onion soup on the internet. So I thought that I would offer uh, a different look at that very classic dish. Okay, so for starters, um, one of the things I like to point out when you're like trying to caramelize onions, trying to caramelize onions, trying to like cook them till they're soft, but still meaty. There's a certain way that I, I really want you to cut your onion. So you see, um, we have the uh, stem end of the onion and the other end of the onion. So I'm gonna cut it through its equator. No, it's, what's the other one? Um, prime meridian. Prime meridian, not through its prime meridian. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> And then I'm gonna cut uh, each end off. Like every chef has their way of like doing onions or like how to break it down. And I, I'm not here to argue with anyone. I'm just telling you what I do, um, whether I'm cooking at my restaurant or at home. So I'm cutting the stem and the um, other end off through its prime meridian, a word I think we probably don't use quite enough. Um, and then to, caramelize these onions, I want to cut them um, with the grain. You know, we talk about the grain of meat a lot. And then if you cut meat against the grain, the meat will be more tender. But in order to like cook onions to a soft, like silky texture, you really want to cut them with the grain. Okay, so I'm gonna go about doing that into like, you know, uh, eight and a Eight, eight of an inch um, slices. And then I'm gonna pile them in a pan. So I think when we talk about caramelized onions, we all often like um, put two onions in a pan and try to caramelize them, but that's never gonna work. You're gonna burn them. You're gonna think they're caramelized because there's brown bits everywhere, but they're not actually gonna be caramelized. They're gonna be burned. So what we're trying to do is like coax out the sugars um, and, and really cook the onions and change, change, move them from PG to R rated. Okay. And that takes a little while, you know, um, onions are no different than humans. So I have a little um, induction burner here and I have a pan that I, uh, bought for my dear friends, Charlotte and Laura, who got married last weekend. And I told them that I would season their pan for them. This is a, a Smithy um, 
carbon steel pan and they did not sponsor any part of this. I just really like this pan. And I told Charlotte and Laura that I would season it. So that's what I'm doing. But really the- Very, very clever. <laughs> <laughs> I also just didn't have a, a, another pan here to do it with. So I had to go in my car and break out their wedding present. <laughs> But the point of this really, I, I likely will not get to the end of caramelizing this through this event, but I wanted to see, I wanted y'all to see how I tend to it, you know what I mean? And, and how it cooks down and how I would actually start it. So you see how mounded up these onions are. What you really want to do to properly caramelize onions is to create like two types of heat. So you, in the beginning, you want to create a steam heat. So all of these onions are going to produce all of this moisture that is going to cook down and the onions are going to soften. And then later on in the process, they are going to kind of succumb to a dry heat where they actually, th their sugars caramelize in the pan. So you want to start with a mound of onions. Otherwise, they're going to get to that dry heat process far too fast and they're just going to burn. We're going to call them caramelized onions, but they're going to be burnt onions. All right, so let me get this going. So to caramelize onions, to make R-rated onions, excuse me, you need to salt them to begin with because the salt is going to start to draw out the moisture, which is going to allow them to steam. And after they steam, they're going to caramelize. Okay, so salt, and I would normally put a lid on them just to kind of like get that going faster. Um, but my, my little uh, carbon steel pan here does not have a lid. So I'm gonna put another lid on top of it. You know, this is all about like making your kitchen work for you and being nimble in it. Um, and I designed all of the recipes in this book to work like 10 degrees from any angle. So it's like, you look at the recipe for just about anything and it's like, I have X, Y, and Z, but I don't have M. Uh, that's okay, because if you write a really good cookbook and you write a really good recipe, it's gonna work whether you do exactly everything uh, the way that the cookbook author advises um, or not. So uh, all of these recipes are designed for them to work with a bit of flexibility. All right, so while these caramelize, um, I'm gonna show you a bit about like what looks like an R-rated onion and what does not and, and where I think that we often go wrong. So, you know, to be fair, it should take more than an hour to get these onions in the place that I want them to be, to be sexy and sultry and meaty and sweet. Uh, you're, you're changing, you know, the structure of a vegetable and that takes time. So I think a lot of times when we're trying to do that, we, we let it go for 45 minutes and we imagine that that must have been enough time. So we end up with onions that are, I don't think that's gonna work, that are about that color. And that would not be a disaster. That's what I'm talking about, 10 degrees on either side of the recipe. That would not be a disaster, but this is what I'm really looking for. Something deep and dark and soft and dang bright meaty. I don't think that that made any sense, I'm sorry. <laughs> All right, so the once you have like your R-rated onions made, um, there's a number of ways to store them. You can store them in, you know, um, Ziploc containers or Tupperware containers or silicone uh, ice trays. Um, and if I do store them in the freezer, I like to put them in, in ice trays that have, you know, small little divots so that I can, oh, my friend, right here, something like this. You make your caramelized onions, stuff them in here, and then pop them out for, um, you know, braises or quick sauces or a lot of the recipes in this book. Um, so these are things that you can just keep around. All of these flavor heroes are, the idea is for this to be your pantry, your uh, nimble flavor boss pantry that you, you know, call on 
two, three times a week. All right, so tonight with our caramelized onions that I've already made, we are going to make one of my um, most favorite recipes in the book, which is called Pinch Me Frenchie. So it's a riff on French onion soup, uh, which is, you know, when you write a, an entire chapter in a book about caramelized R-rated onions, people expect you to have a French onion soup recipe in that book. Um, but, you know, as I said, there's a million on the internet. So I wanted to do something a little bit different. So this is basically like a, um, a monkey bread, a savory monkey bread that's made with caramelized onions, um, smoked Gouda and Parmesan cheese. And it is like a savory, it's R rated. That okay. sounds so good. <laughs> <laughs> so what, um, what I'm gonna do in the book, I suggest making a, a yeast dough. I give, not suggest, I give you a recipe for a yeast dough, like a dinner roll dough that you then go about making like monkey bread with. But tonight I'm gonna give you a little hack on this because I, I've been known to write recipes for things that I hack on my own at home. And so I'm gonna grab some um, refrigerator biscuits out of my refrigerator, Vivian Howard's refrigerator. <laughs> All right, sorry. It took me a minute to find them in that catastrophe that is there. All right, so these are just like Food Line brand buttermilk jumbo biscuits. I um, My instructions at the store were just don't get the ones that flake up like Hungry Jack, just because I don't think that would work in here. Um, but this buying the refrigerator biscuits is gonna make this like a lot easier for you to do um, if, if baking is not something you particularly enjoy. But this recipe is like a, a savory kind of um, guilty pleasure, if you will. And I think it's a great thing to have for a party. I think it would be amazing for um, any kind of like tailgate. I don't actually, I don't think we tailgate nowadays. Um, but the idea, hold on one second. Okay, so the idea is to take a baking pan. Uh, you could take a bunt pan, that's what I recommend in the book. Um, but a lot of people don't have bunt pans, so I'm going to use just like an oval baking pan and I'm going to spray it with some nonstick baking spray. And then I'm gonna take my refrigerator biscuits, which I have cut into four pieces. You could also just tear them into pieces. It really doesn't matter. And I have mixed uh, two types of cheeses here, uh, smoked Gouda and Parmesan cheese. And, you know, um, never use if you can help it, the parm from the green uh, container. I, I always, I believe in grating fresh parm. I love my microplane. I've been known to sleep with it. Um, and so you want to have, when cheese is a big part of something, you want to make sure it's, it's also a great part of something. So don't skimp on that ingredient. And then I have caramelized onions or R-rated onions that are cooked to a sultry, deep sweetness. And I have melted butter, which isn't quite as melted anymore, but I don't actually think that matters. Um, and I'm gonna stir that, the butter, with the caramelized onions and some fresh picked thyme. I'm gonna stir that together. And so, you know, I don't know if you have made like the classic monkey bread recipe with 
Um, I think it's maybe biscuits. Heck yeah. Yeah, and you roll them in like butter and then cinnamon and sugar. So this is the same idea here. So I have the R-rated onions mixed with the melted butter, uh, the smoked Gouda, you could use Fontina mixed with the grated parm, and then I have my baking sheet right here. So what I'm gonna do first, I'm gonna tend to my onions. You see how they've shrunk so much already and how they're steaming? And how my friend's wedding gift is seasoning right here. I cannot tell you how genius that is. <laughs> well, I hope they appreciate it. It's like giving books. You just ha may have to read it yourself before it gets to its recipient. All right, so now I'm gonna take my like quarters of biscuits and drop a few in here in my butter and caramelized onion mixture with the thyme in it. And I'm gonna roll it around in there. I'm gonna drop it into the cheese and then I'm gonna put it in the bottom of my baking dish. And like when I was learning to cook in a kitchen, like one of the first things I learned was like this standard breading procedure where you're supposed to, when you are, are taking something, an ingredient through something wet and then putting it in something dry, how you're supposed to use one hand or the other so that both hands um, stay clean. I've never, ever, ever done that once. So tonight will be no different. I'm gonna have both hands covered in R-rated onions and cheese. So, oh well. Uh, but the idea is that these little, um, if you make the recipe in the book, which is like yeast rolls, or if you use uh, refrigerator biscuits, which is fine too, they're rolled in the caramelized onion butter mixture, then they're rolled in this cheese mixture, and then you place them all along the bottom of this baking dish and they get baked together and then you pull it apart. And that's why it's called pinch me Frenchy because it's a pinch me loaf, um, but it's kind of like French onion soup. Um, you know, the whole premise behind this book is a little bit like um, smarter meal prep, if you will. I know a lot of y'all on Sundays or over the weekend, probably try to get ahead on cooking for the week. You know, you might make a stock, you might roast some Brussels sprouts that you're then gonna reheat uh, later in the week and, and they'll be worse than they were the first time you roasted them. Uh, or you might grill some chicken breast that you also then reheat and it's also worse than the first time you cooked it. So my like plea one that I'm, you know, screaming through this book is about being like smarter about the ways you get ahead in your kitchen. You know, if you make one of these flavor heroes in this book every week, and then you build up a little pantry of the flavor heroes, you can literally shop at the grocery store every Sunday or Saturday and get the same 10 ingredients and then cook them completely differently throughout the week. So this is about like making you um, more nimble and empowering you more in the kitchen. So you see I'm filling up this baking dish right here with my little biscuit R-rated onion cheese globs. And I'm gonna continue to fill that in and then I'm gonna put a second layer on top. And then I'm gonna bake it in a 350 degree oven for uh, about 30 to 35 minutes. And you just want it to be brown and bubbly and you want it to smell like frankly intoxicating. So I have already done that. Although it may not seem like it, I was a little bit prepared. Uh, and while this looks beautiful. This is after 35 minutes. Like the way that I like to serve this is to is to pinch it right out of the top. <laughs> I'm gonna 
slice around the outside. Don't you love that? I was just touting how prepared I was. Thank Perfect. God. All right. So look, um, you can see that this is like whew, pretty fantastic looking. And so what I'm going to do now is start to pinch my little pieces off. And so I have this slight biscuit that is covered in R-rated onions, smoked gouda cheese, Parmesan. It's crispy around the outside. It smells like thyme. It's freaking delicious. And all I had to do was spend five minutes. If I had normal knife skills like all y'all, it would take me about 10 minutes, but I spent five minutes. Um, slicing onions and then I just need to be in my kitchen washing dishes cleaning up after a night of cooking or before I'm really cooking or just being in the kitchen stirring these you know every 10 minutes I've made this I put in the work here it was really a lot of non-active work and then I made this super cool incredibly memorable pinch me Frenchie loaf also took me about 10 minutes so that is the premise for the, this book. This is why I think everybody needs it. We've been cooking more than ever in our lives. We're all bored as hell by it, let's be honest. This is a new way to look at your kitchen. It's a new way to organize the way you cook. It's the way that I cook. I swear to God, it's the way that most chefs probably cook. Um, and I, I hope that I hope that becomes the way you cook. So I think I'm going to take some questions if anyone has any. Um, and I'm going to eat my pinchy Frenchy like. Yes. Let me just turn my own video on. This is really good. <laughs> I'm so jealous, Vivian. I just turned to the page about um, chicken for pregnant people. And oh, that's one of my favorites. <laughs> I have to say, I'm about seven months pregnant right now, and I'm crawling through my computer screen to um, eat your pinch me Frenchie. Well, you should have your partner make you dinner for pregnant people. I, w I will be. I will be putting this right in front of him. Um, okay, so our first question comes from Catherine, and... Um, Catherine's wondering, is it better to use sweet onions or regular white onions, or does it matter? Great question. Great, great question. So I would say that whenever I'm, my culinary onion that I cook with is generally like a yellow Spanish onion. Um, I think that you can find them anywhere. They caramelize, you know, just about like any other onion. If you find yourself with Vidalias or a sweet onion or even a red onion, you can do this too. Um, the fact is, is that every onion, no matter the variety, is going to react differently to heat uh, because of its age. You know, like a, a younger onion that has been, you know, pulled from the ground and, and sat for less time is going to have more moisture and it's going to cook slower. Um, so any onion works for this. I mean, with the exception of scallions, really without a bowl. Um, but you could do this with shallots, you could do it with red onions, you could do it with sweet onions. But I generally choose a yellow for Spanish onion. It says yellow, but they're not really yellow, they're white, but whatever. I've confused you more. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> that was great. Um, any onions, onions, any onion can become R rated. Exactly. Right caressing and time I'm learning. Um, okay, we have a great question from Mara, who is 11 years old. Mara loves to hear her mom tell stories about being in the kitchen with her great grandmothers. What is your favorite kitchen memory to share with your own children? Oh, me. M maybe the time my mom slapped me in the kitchen. <laughs> no, 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 no. Um, you know, my mom, uh, taught me the first and one of the only things she really taught me to make as a, a young person in the kitchen was scrambled eggs. And 
that become that became the thing that she did for all of her grandchildren and you know i have a vague memory of learning to make scrambled eggs with my mom but i have a better memory of watching my mom make scrambled eggs with my children um and so that's something that i'll um i'll never forget and i hope that that i'll carry it on it's a favorite in our house too and you know what my mom only slapped me in the kitchen because i was talking back to her so you keep that in mind we certainly will. Um, I have a question, which is um, just this time obviously has been so strange. Um, so how has uh, how has your cooking and especially your restauranteering, how, how have you been sort of nimble and ad adapting in the time of COVID in your own kitchen and, and in your um, commercial kitchen as well? Um, well, you know, um, our restaurant kitchen, Chef and the Farmer, we closed in March. So we um, had to figure out some revenue streams to take us through this period. And this book actually became the major one. Uh, we had we had a little uh, online like bake shop that we had been operating for about a year called Handy and Hot. And we decided to kind of turn that into a quarantine kit shop shop where we sold several of the flavor heroes from this book. And we sold the Little Green Dress, which is uh, one of the chapters, Red Weapons, Community Organizer, and, and sent recipes that are not in the book with these flavor heroes so that people could like have a new experience in the kitchen and make cooking dinner uh, easier for a few nights with our condiments. So that is, you know, one way that I think we were really nimble and also uh, relied on work that had already been done in the pursuit of writing this book. And I ate, I ate a lot too. I don't know if that counts. I think, I think that's, a, that's a universal at this point for this time. Um, Julie is wondering, what does it mean to you to be a North Carolina chef? Um, I mean, I think that, you know, North Carolina is where I come from. It's, um, my home, you know, I feel a deep connection to this place. I, I really can't imagine living anywhere else. Um, but I, you know, I think I'm more than a North Carolina chef. You know, I think that I um, make food that appeals to people everywhere, and um, and I and I hope that that we don't continue to look at things as like I'm 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 from here. I'm of here. I'm about this. I'm only you know. I'm only. Um, I'm, I'm this or I'm that, uh, because I, I certainly believe that I'm more than just a North Carolina chef. And I, I hope that, that people understand that about me. I love that answer. I think that um, it's especially poignant given where we are at the moment. Um, all over the country, so I appreciate that. Andrea wants to know, what's your favorite recipe from this book? Well, right now, this, this Pinch Me Frenchie is really doing it for me. <laughs> um, you know, I have to name one of the, the flavor heroes for sure, because that's what the book is about. And I want you to master making them so that they can become uh, like something that you rotate through your kitchen all the time. And I think one of the most versatile ones and one of the easiest to use is something that I call Little Green Dress, which is, I think I mentioned it earlier, uh, kind of like a chimichurri and a salsa verde, had a baby in a bed of olives. And it's called Little Green Dress because it really looks good, tastes good on everything, like 
a little black dress. I don't know if you ever eaten a little black dress off of someone, but I imagine it would taste good. Um, so that, you know, that is my, uh, my flavor hero and I'm sticking with it. That's great. A, a related note is, were any of the flavor heroes, did any of the flavor heroes surprise you as you were developing the book? Um, or did you already know going in kind of these are my go-tos? Are um, there any that emerged? No, well, so this is so rooted in like the way that I have been cooking at my restaurants for a long time. Um, but I will say one that has been surprising and for the uh, woman, Andrea Weigel, who tested the recipes in the book for me, um, her favorite uh, hero is Quirky Furky, which is a take on Japanese furikake, which is a, a, a seasoning for rice traditionally in Japan. And it's, it's, it's sea driven, it has seaweed, it has bonito, it has sesame. Um, and, and I so deeply respect the cuisine and the culture of Japan that it's something that I've kind of always study and revere. Um, and I've cooked with furikake for a long time, but I always wanted to have like some kind of acid element and maybe even more crunch. So in my um, quirky furky, as we call it, I added like crushed up uh, salt and vinegar potato chips for that acid and that crunch. And I, um, so that for me has been really probably the most surprising um, because it's definitely the least expected from my own kitchen. Um, but, you know, I believe in, in, you know, looking outside your own like cultural canon for inspiration and Japan has long been one for me. Um, and so I look there and then I guess put my American stamp on it. Uh, I don't know if that's a good or bad thing, but it's all out of love and respect. That's wonderful. Um, a couple more questions uh, from Allison. Is there any recipe or flavor hero that you think is especially good for the season we're in right now for fall? Absolutely. So our rated onions for sure, because they have a deep um, meaty, sweetness that I think screams like cooler weather. You can add R rated onions to any kind of like soup you're making and they're going to add a lot of like even like deep flavor and viscosity if they're cooked long enough and, and properly so that because they will dissolve. So R rated onions for sure. There's an entire chapter called Bees Nuts, which are uh, spiced pecans that I've been using in my food for a decade. Um, and pecans are obviously like Thanksgiving, fall, just everything right now. Um, so I think that's a great one. Also can do kraut, which is the chapter where I encourage everybody to make their own kraut is something that I think of in the fall um, when cabbage is in season, but it's certainly something you can make all year. So yeah, this is this is um, a prom season for this will make it taste good. We have a quick question, which is where can we get our hands on that shirt? I know. Um, well, they just came in today. And so we're, they're gonna be at vivianhoward.com starting tomorrow. And it says, this will make it taste good. <laughs> we, we followed. <laughs> that is great news. Yes, we have some really cute ones too that have red uh, collars and uh, sleeve rings, which here, ah. Wow, perfectly timed toss. <laughs> I'm especially proud of um, you, bringing up the shirts kind of like um, points to something that this book is so beautiful, the design, the photography, the very uh, dialed in aesthetic of it. And so it made making, you know, merchandise really easy and exciting. Um, and I have some people to thank for that. 
uh, Baxter Miller, who's sitting right here, uh, was the photographer for the book um, and all the pretty pictures you've ever seen of me, she takes. Her, her partner, Ryan Stansel, did everything else, except for make the dishes and wash the dishes, because I did that. Uh, <laughs> but, um, and then Laura Palese, uh, design the book and you know if you've never written a cookbook um, all the elements that go into it are you know they kind of reveal themselves as you go through the process and Laura was just a, an amazing designer to work with and she really got what we were trying to do and so as a result we have all this really fun stuff to share with you beyond just the book. It has been very fun to receive the graphics and get to push them out there. I, I echo that. Um, a, it's like, oh, that's, that was Yeah, great. it looks fun. It, it, it makes it taste good and it makes it seem fun, which is a good combo. Um, couple more questions. This one is sort of a combined question from um, two different folks, Shannon and Greta. Um, Shannon says, we live in a college town. So what's your advice to young folks who are heading out on their own for the first time and just learning how to cook? And the sort of second part of that question is with your own story, um, Greta recently learned that you graduated from NC State and wants to know what did you major in and did you always plan to end up as a chef? So your fresh out of college journey too. Okay, so first answer to that, um, what are some things that people who are just starting to cook should learn? How to roast a whole chicken. Um, because if you can roast a whole chicken, then you, even if you live alone, then you have, you know, food for several days. And there are, I think, six recipes for roasted chicken in This Will Make It Taste Good, because I think it's such an important skill for people to, to understand. And it's so easy. And, you know, it's, it's the most economic way to buy a chicken is a whole chicken. Um, in many cases in this book, I roast a chicken on top of something else so that you're cooking both things at the same time. Um, I think that is incredibly important. I think it's incredibly important to understand how to blanch and shock vegetables. You know, if there's a meal prep that you're, you're, you're trying to do on the weekends for the week, aside from making the flavor heroes in here, I think that blanching and shocking vegetables is more viable um, and will uh, end in a tastier result than roasting them and then reheating them. Um, and then the other part of the question was, what was the other question? <laughs> the other question was about you and I think you were a journalism major, oh, yes. but, I, I, so but I'm not positive. Yes. So your own story fresh out of college. Okay, yes. Yeah. So I was an English language major and I wanted to be a journalist. I know not many people go to NC State for that, but um, I, uh, you know, I did not grow up cooking. I did not think that I was going to be a chef and I, I moved to New York to be a journalist and started working in restaurants because I had done that all through college. Um, and the restaurants that I worked out at in Raleigh are no longer there, or I would tell you about them. Well, I think it's natural, or it makes sense that for you, storytelling has always been a part of what you do as well. Um, so there is one more question. Do you think there will be a third cookbook in the future? That's from Nicole, who loves you, adores Deep Run Roots, and cannot wait to receive This Will Make It Taste Good in the mail. Um, Nicole, I hope so, because I so love, um, writing this book, uh, has been the most joyful creative endeavor of my life. Um, you know, writing Deep Run Roots was very much, I looked at it as kind of like a historical document, uh, kind of, um, recording the, the food history of a region. And this was really catharsis. It, like, this is who I am. This is what I'm about. This is, these are the struggles I've um, gone through. And this is the way that I cook at home. You know, I hope that I get to write 
um, a third cookbook. And I hope I get to write things other than cookbooks because I, you know, I've always dreamed of being a writer. And, you know, I went about a very uh, meandering path to get to this place. And I sure as hell am not going to squander it. So. I love that. Amanda has just chimed in to say, we are enjo enjoying the shirt eggs and our rated onions and they are delicious. Thank oh, you for yeah. everything you have done to highlight North Carolina, especially the Eastern part of our state. And as one who has roots in Kinston and the Eastern part of North Carolina myself, I would echo the same. Um, we have one last question and then anything else you wanna add before uh, we end the night. Um, Tara is looking for some advice about ordering in a restaurant like yours to have the experience that you would most want them to have. Do you have any tips? Absolutely, great question. Is you know what I do when I go to a restaurant that I know the staff is engaged? I say, hey, what would you like for me to have? You know, this is how hungry I am. Um, can you make some recommendations? And then just trust them. And by, by all means, don't ever ask a server that and then not trust them because it's gonna piss them off. Um, but yeah, I would say like the, your server knows the restaurant and the food better than probably anyone else. They also understand people's reactions to the food. So it's not always about like the chef's favorites because often the chef's favorites kind of highlight, you know, not necessarily the guest favorites, but what we as chefs are most excited about. Uh, so I would ask your server, have them curate it for you, tell them how hungry you are, and I think you'll have a great experience. If not, send me an email. I'll apologize. Awesome. Thank you so much. And thanks for those really great questions. Um, I love that this was a, a work of great joy for you. And I love hearing that in this strange year of 2020, um, this has been such a bright spot and it is bound to be a bright spot in our lives now that it's in our hands. So we're so grateful. Thanks for the wonderful questions, everyone. I'm gonna turn it back over to Ada to wrap us up. Thank you all. Thanks Vivian so much. This was right on time and perfect. Um, I just want to let everyone know that we have signed copies. Um, and if you were here in 2016, there is this awesome essay that really gives us a behind the scenes look at being on that particular book tour that just sort of brings us back and um, connects us with a time that I hope we get back to in the future, which is bringing authors to our um, our brick and mortar. Vivian, thank you so, so very much. My pleasure. Thank you all so much. Good luck. Good night. Good night.